Okay, everybody. Um, today we've got a, a talk invited from um, our nearby neighbour, University of Sydney, uh, Joe, who's involved with some of the things we're doing there, with um, B and the ITRP application and so on. Um, I <coughs> don't have any biographical information on Joe. That's so okay. I asked him to give him a bit of an introduction to himself. So um, we've got an interesting topic, but um, I'll let Joe tell us a few things about himself before he moves on to talk about clusters. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. Uh, so uh, my education was here at the University of New South Wales. My right. degrees were done here. I have now migrated to our collaborators over at U University of New South Wales, where my area of uh, research is plasma physics. And the talk I'll be giving today would be about one of those areas of research in plasma physics, which is about spacecraft propulsion using plasmas. So in particular, I'm going to talk about the charge exchange thruster. If you look up a textbook on thrusters for propulsion, you'll see all sorts of types, uh, but you will not see something called a charge exchange thruster. So this concept is an innovation uh, from our work at the University of Sydney. And so here's the outline of the talk. And um, the first thing I need to tell you about is the rocket equation and propulsion, because that pretty much determines the type of technology you want to uh, develop. So in particular, I need to tell you why electric propulsion is important. Uh, and it has certain applications for uh, spacecraft that are already in orbit but not for taking off from the ground, but I'll talk more about that. But when you have electric propulsion, then there is something you need to do to neutralize the exhaust or the plume that emerges from the spacecraft. So I'll need to talk about that. And finally, I'll introduce the charge exchange thruster, which is a self-neutralizing thruster. No need for extra apparatus to do that. And finally, I'll tell you about the current state of affairs, which is the miniaturized charge exchange thruster, particularly applicable to the new generation of small satellites known as nanosatellites or picosatellites. So here's uh, the rocket equation. Uh, allow me, I'll only put up two equations. Uh, if you're equation phobic, I'll just allow me two equations. So the term on the left hand side, and the reason I'm putting this up is because to show you the importance of electric propulsion for certain applications. On the left hand side is the velocity increment, that is, whatever velocity you have, you can increase it by a certain amount, and that's the velocity increment. On the right hand side, you'll notice that the velocity increment depends on linearly, on the exhaust speed. So if you measure the velocity of the atoms that are coming out, then uh, that's U subscript E. Now, interestingly, the, the next term is the logarithm of the ratio between the initial mass of the whole spacecraft, including thruster and fuel and all that, and payload, to the final mass of the spacecraft. So this is a very interesting equation, although it may not look like it initially, and I'll, sh I'll show you why. <coughs> Here's a plot of this equation. On the left-hand side is the velocity increment. On the right-hand side is that <coughs> mass ratio that we've just seen. Notice that if I increase the, the mass ratio, for example, uh, uh, a space shuttle taking off when they used to take off would have the final, the final ratio when, it, when it's burnt all this fuel, when it's up in orbit. Uh, when, so the initial mass to the final mass would have been somewhere around here, 15, 16, maybe up to 20. And notice this, as you increase that mass ratio, that is you're throwing out a lot of fuel, then the in increment in the, in the, in the, uh, in the delta V is very tiny. It's a point of diminishing returns. It doesn't help you. So, uh, unless you want a, a very inefficient way to, say, take off from Earth. Now, notice each one, of, each one of these graphs is that exhaust speed. If I double the exhaust speed, I'm essentially double, doubling the in velocity increment. If I triple it, I triple the velocity increment. So, increasing the exhaust speed is much more effective than increasing your uh, mass ratio. And this is why, and I'll show you, this is why electric propulsion is in incredibly useful. Because what it, what it allows you to do is almost arbitrarily increase the exhaust speed without having to muck around with the velocity, uh, with the mass ratio at all. 
So I'll give you an example. If you're after <coughs> uh, going uh, directly uh, from Earth to Mars, so these days they don't necessarily go directly, they have gravitational assist and all this sort of thing to get there, but if you wanted to go directly, so you'll need to first of all go into the Mars orbit, which is a delta V of 2.97 kilometers per second, and when you get to the Mars orbit, you need to get into orbit around Mars. That's another increment of 2.63 kilometers per second. A total increment of around 5.6 kilometers a second. That's what you need to increase your delta V by. So let me give you other examples. If you look at the planets, and now not so, not so much of a planet, there's the di different delta Vs. <coughs> the smallest one you could look at is either Venus or Mars. Uh, even, I mean, negative doesn't mean smaller, it just means in the opposite direction. You have to be uh, slowing, trying to slow down with this sort of exhaust speed. So, and this says travel time, not so important. Uh, however, you'll notice that there's nothing below five. If you look at the exhaust speed of, say, uh, traditional propulsion, which is chemical propulsion, they go, exhaust speeds go from one to four kilometers a second. But what they have is a lot of thrust. It's very inefficient, but if there's a lot of thrust, it'll get you up into orbit. And that's still a prevailing technology. We still haven't yet replaced this. Optimally, if you, you want an average, then you really want, for interplanetary travel, you want, really want a speed of around 10 kilometers per second, exhaust speed. The other thing that chemical rockets are limited by is the energy per atom. It's em energy that's contained within the chemical bonds of the chemicals, and that's all you have. You've got so much energy per unit volume, and you're stuck with that. And so you've got to use up a lot of volume or a lot of fuel. All right, so now let me tell you why electric propulsion overcomes all this. With electric propulsion, first of all, let me tell you what it is. First of all, you take atoms and you ionize them. You strip all their electrons off. If your system is particularly good, most systems strip, strip them partially. So some atoms are ionized, some are not. And then you accelerate them with a grid. So here we have an ion source. Here is a wire mesh, if you like, accelerating the ions. And when the ions accelerate, you can determine their speed by the by the voltage difference that you apply between these two electrodes. That's it. You can actually determine your delta V. The trouble is when they head past through, uh, through the grid and off into uh, space, in this case, you cannot have ions just leaving, uh, ions here being positively charged, because eventually the spacecraft will, um, will acquire a significant negative charge. And that will draw ions back in, and all propulsion stops at that point. You need to neutralize the charge, and so what they have is an external electron source called the neutralizer, and that ejects, ejects electrons into the plume, and off they go. If you get the balance right, you have a neutral plume in your exhaust, and then uh, that's it. You, you, you can keep, on, uh, keep the propulsion going for quite some time, as long as your fuel lasts. So that's the basis of electric propulsion. The reason that you can get arbitrary delta Vs, or almost arbitrary delta Vs, is, is why you would do it. And so here is the, one of the most widely used electric propulsion systems called the Hall thruster or Hall effect thruster. I won't go through all the details, but it uses magnetic fields to try and confine uh, charge, ele electron, an electron cloud, if you like. You can call this, it's called a virtual cathode. You have an ion source that gets attracted to this cathode and gets accelerated out. So what this, what this thruster does, it replaces a metal grid with a, a cloud of electrons. So you're not eroding the metal grid with the ions that are, heading, that are heading out. Moreover, the same source that's supplying the electrons can also supply electrons that leave with the ions and therefore produce neutralization. So, uh, and if, in this case, you can have, from the whole thruster, you can have exhaust speeds of 10 to 30 kilometers a second, much, much uh, higher than any chemical rocket can ever do. And so now that opens up the possibility of, of maybe traveling directly to planets, rather than trying to use planetary assist to, get, uh, to gain momentum and velocity in order to get you to a, the spot where you have to go, or comet assist or something like that, which is, I think, what they do now. 
The other thing, the, the disadvantage with electric propulsion is uh, uh, it's the low thrust. So they're really, at the moment, they're really, it's really an energy source problem and we don't have such an energy source to, to supply uh, kilowatts and megawatts uh, to a spacecraft electrically. So uh, at the moment, so it's, it's, this is more uh, power that you can get from solar panels. So we're limited to very small amounts of power. So the thrusts are low. In, in millinewtons, usually to newtons. And, and this, this sort of thrust seems low, but in fact, you can, you can keep it on for much, much longer than you can, you can chemical rockets, and, and in the end, you can acquire the delta V that you need to acquire in a sh essentially a shorter amount of time uh, to get you, to, uh, uh, to get you the, to the, your destination. So here's another cartoon of how it works. Here's an electron gun supplying, uh, supplying uh, uh, the virtual cathode, if you like, and there's a propellant being ionized. There are, there's magnetic field coils to trap the electrons around there. And here's, one, here's a whole thruster in operation. Uh, that's the neutralizer right there, and that's the plume, as you can see. And the electrons there would be going out with the plume and neutralizing it. Uh, uh, there, is, there are problems with degradation, that is, ions can also strike this neutralizer and, and slowly erode it over time. Okay, so now the charge exchange thruster. And uh, if I can explain how, how this actually works to start off with. So here's the mechanics of it. It's, it's uh, at, at the outset, it looks uh, incredibly simple and, and mecha the mechanics of it are, it is, it's, it's a very, very simple thing. So let me explain the, the, the cosmetic appearance of it. There is a metal cone here and there is a, a metal plate here and there is an enclosure made of some uh, insulator, electrical insulator like, like glass or ceramic and there is a little pipe there to allow gas to flow through. Now, you might think, oh, that, that's ridiculously simple, what can that do? Alright, so the complexity of what this does is not in the structure itself, it's in the physics that emerges inside this conical region right here. And so let me flick through. These are actual measurements. So if we measure the electric potential, here called the floating potential, along the axis of the thruster, so for example, this point uh, so this is distance along the x-axis, potential along the, uh, uh, the y-axis, and the cone is, uh, there is a negative voltage applied to the cone. As you saw from the previous one, this is anode, which in physics is the positive electrode, and cathode is the negative electrode. So if you measure the electric potential without putting any, any plasma in there, uh, Admittedly, these measurements were taken with a plasma. And I'll explain what a plasma is in a moment. Uh, the, the potential starts to fall as you go through the cone. As, so as we're traveling this way, this, you start to get a fall in potential. And that has implications. A fall in potential means there's an electric field pointing, in this case, to, to your right. An electric field pointing to your right means you can accelerate ions. If you can control the voltage on this cone, you can control the acceleration speed, or the final speed um, resulting from the acceleration. So why is it called charge exchange thruster? And why does it have a conical appearance? Do you need a cone to get this shape? Well, yes, a cone does produce the shape and potential. But this cone has, a, has that appearance for another reason. If, if you just use ions and you accelerate them out, Nothing has changed. Ions are still accelerating and emerging, and finally the spacecraft will, will have a negative charge, so it'll all stop. You need to neutralize them. So I've got a little chemical equation, if you, if you like. Imagine, for simplicity, not that this is actually the fuel that we're going to use, we have a hydrogen ion just sitting on top of the hill or anywhere along here. And it starts to accelerate within the volume of this cone. So, uh, if if you make the shape of the cone uh, as such or something similar, you are able to have a, a reasonably high gas pressure in there compared to the vacuum of space outside. 
because if you don't, you'll be letting out more gas and you'll be wasting fuel. So what you do is this shape is to produce a pressure differential within and between inside and outside the thruster. <coughs> because there is sufficient gas here, as the iron, as the as the hydrogen ion starts to <coughs> accelerate, then uh, uh, because the gas pressure is high enough, it can steal or pick up an electron from the surrounding gas particles, here sy symbolized by a molecular hydrogen like that. This is charge exchange. It's not a collision in the traditional sense. It's not bang, picked up a hydrogen atom. It's more like a drive-by. <laughs> it goes past and uh, so close that the electron finds it energetically more favorable to jump across to this ion. And now what happens? This ion, that's this, picks up an electron from the gas and so it becomes this. I put a star there because sometimes the electron is in an excited state and the, the, ion, uh, the now neutral, neutralized ion emits light. And so what you're left behind is an, an, an ion. This guy, was, this guy was the neutral gas. He's now had his electron missing. Which then, that ion can itself, if it's somewhere in here, can accelerate and undergo charge exchange itself. So there's an avalanche reaction that can, can occur. A chain of neutralization. And, and once it's neutralized, they just keep going out because there are no electrostatic forces on them at all. And you've got a neutralized plume. So it's a self-neutralizing uh, ion acceleration system. If you recall the diagram, maybe I'll bring it up. Electric propulsion requires three stages. Ion generation, <coughs> ion acceleration, and then subsequent neutralization. So three stages have to occur. In the charge exchange thruster, the generation, acceleration, and neutralization are occur occurring as a matter of the physics that occurs inside that cone, rather than any extra structures that you make. So it's a, it's a self-neutralizing structure. The simplicity means there are no moving parts. There's uh, not a lot of components that can go wrong. So if you have ever built more complicated systems, you know the more parts it has, the more chance it has of going wrong somewhere. So that's, uh, here's another diagram, probably. So, so just to explain that equation, so does that mean you're just expelling, you're expelling <coughs> um, particles that are not charged? Correct. So all the, neutral charged ones, all the charged ones stay inside, and it's the... Yes, so some, some charged particles might see the outside world, but they're quickly attracted back, and that's fine. But they're a minority. If you design your cone, with the right aspect ratios and the right pressure inside and the right gas inside. So see, by looking at the cone, you don't know how to make this, trust me. You have to get all those parameters right and you'll find you can get quite a high efficiency of not, not many particles, not many charged particles making it outside, mostly neutral particles. So yeah, sure. so, yeah. There's one more. If you're accelerating through that grid, Oh well, not the grid. Well, but, it's a, it's but effectively, a, you've got you've got that change of potential. You're moving through. That is the the acceleration is caused by an ion. Ah, the fact that it's ionized, right? And the fact that it's ionized. And, and, and as soon as it picks, as soon as it becomes neutral, it's no longer affected by that by the grid. So, does it actually exit? It or? does indeed, and I'll show you. Mm -hmm. It does. Uh, so it, there are no electrostatic forces on it at all. So that's it's self-neutralizing. Yeah. Okay, so here's a little, another cartoon, same sort of information. <coughs> I've tried to scrunch this potential down into the cone because that's where it mostly changes. The bulk of it, it doesn't change. Now, I mentioned plasma. Plasma is just a, a soup. It's an ionized gas, so you've got the ions and electrons sort of in the vicinity of each other, not very much separated from each other. So plasmas tends to look, tend to look warm and fuzzy, and they are indeed warm and fuzzy. So, uh, so if I refer to the word plasma, it's... Uh, it is that. Um, okay, so yeah, that's all. This is another cartoon. It's ion accelerating, ions accelerating and undergoing charge exchange and emerging. Uh, so it's, it really is that simple. In this, the, the version I'm about to show you, it was our very first version that we published a paper on. <coughs> and it had a glass tube separating anode and cathode. And it worked fine. Uh, I'm, here it is. Here's our very first version. What, how long is it? It's about maybe 20 centimeters. Uh, let's see, 15 plus 8, that's 23 centimeters long. 
And what you see here is gas coming in. Uh, there's a positive electrode here. That's the cone right there. Uh, and that's a negative electrode, your cathode. It's hollow. Is the cone glass? Uh, the cone, so it's made of metal. In this case, it's made of uh, stainless steel. Okay. Yeah. It has to be metal, otherwise, you will not get this. You will, if it's not made of metal, you will not get this effect. Okay. It can't be ceramic. Well, no, I'm just going to see it in there. I'm just going to see it in the oh. program, so. Oh, right, yes, indeed. So the contrast, uh, it wasn't a very high, high resolution camera or, or a very good camera at all that took this, but it's the only one we have of this. So, oh, I see it. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there's the cone, if I can trace its outline. The reason, I'll tell you why you can't see it. There's a plasma outside which wouldn't occur in space. Our chamber is not a spacecraft testing chamber. It doesn't have a high pumping rate. With a, with a, with a proper like two meter chamber, two meter long chamber, one meter wide, you can get very high pumping rates and you don't end up with much gas pressure outside. You can mimic the environment of space. This is a very tiny chamber, uh, but it's all we have access to. And, and so a bit of gas is outside and that gets ionized and it tends to obscure the shape of the cathode right there. But you see the nice bloom coming out. Ignore any extra stuff. It's, uh, it was another anode. It was not necessary. It's just me trying to get, become academic about the whole thing. Uh, uh, so that's it. Now, it looks rather simple. I'll show you, I'll show you a, 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 a graph that we get from our spectrometer. So what we do then... Before you move on, yeah. so that's for hydrogen? This is hydrogen, and I'll show you that's not particularly... Oh, oh I'm, sh I'm going to show you how we get the exhaust speed. 300 kilometers a second. That looks, wow, you've got a great delta V. That must be really good. And for you that know about propulsion, that's not necessarily very good. And I'll show you why in a moment. But yes, we're using hydrogen here because uh, we had it in the lab. We've used argon. That argon's better. The heavier the gas is, the better it is. But in this case, it was a high hydrogen that we were using. Why is the, why is the plasma different? Colors, like blue and oh, indeed. Okay, so what you see here, so the plasma itself is the, the purple, purple looking thing. The reason this looks blue is because there are electrons given out by the cathode uh, on the inside, and when, they, when the electrons strike the glass, the glass fluoresces in the blue. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, it's very pretty. Well, it's going to say, it's just going to say all the forms of propulsion, it's the one that looks most like, you know, science fiction. Or <laughs> it does, it looks. Uh, it looks really cool, uh, even when it's running. And uh, I'll show you a, a, an even cooler picture. Uh, because this is really, this is an idea from, from inception, like uh, can, can we make a plume that's self-neutralizing, go in one direction? And so this was the very first thing we tried. All right, so I'm, I want to show you a, 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 one of the measurements we do. We do lots of measurements on these. I'm going to show you how we get this figure, 300 kilometers a second. So what we do, do you see this blue here? Hopefully this blue is showing. This blue is with the plume striking the, 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 the glass bell jar, which, which is part of the vacuum chamber. It's got a bell jar on it. And on the other side of this glass, we have a spectrometer that can disperse the light uh, coming from this plume into the wavelength and intensity at each wavelength. So let me show you a graph. Here we have wavelength of our spectrometer in particular, and, and here we have intensity, and in particular we're looking at, at what's called the hydrogen H alpha line. It's a certain transition of, in hydrogen from n equals 3 to n equals 2, if I, if I got my uh, quantum numbers right. Now, this is the hydrogen H alpha line. If you do spectroscopy like this on hydrogen discharges, you will not see this bit right here. But with this charge exchange thruster, what emerges is this bit. Sorry, there are several graphs superimposed, not explained on here. This is from a paper, and overlaid is, uh, it should be different, <coughs> different voltages. What you see here is a Doppler spectrum. It is this line, Doppler shifted. If, if an ion is heading towards it at high speed, then the wavelength of that light shortens. The amount of, the amount of shortening of that light, the, uh, the delta lambda as it works, the, the change in wavelength, tells you about the velocity of that atom. And this, it's self-calibrating. If, you know, if you know this wavelength, the Doppler shifted wavelength, then you know the velocity. There is no calibration to do. So from this, uh, it's easy enough to show that an average uh, plume speed there of the, of the hydrogen atoms is 300 kilometers a second. Um, and so these measurements are relatively easy to do. Okay. 
I need to tell you why 300 kilometers a second is not good for a lot of applications. First of all, you never need a delta V of 300 kilometers a second. As you saw from that table, you need maybe 15, maybe 17. You don't need 300. So you shouldn't have a delta V greater than what you actually need. And I'll show you why. There's another equation, which I've put in terms of words. The power in the plume. Uh, OK, so the, the electrical power I put in, a certain percentage, is, percentage of it goes to the plume. It might be 50% in hall thrusters. It could be 50 or 60 or even 70%. The electrical power, 70% of that goes into the plume. Quite efficient, actually. This one is a little less efficient than the whole thruster. You might get 50 or maybe 40%. So these figures are still to be determined. Uh, we have only rough figures because the thruster itself is still an emerging technology. We're experimenting with different form factors of it. So the, the power in the plume, and therefore the power that you supply, is on the left-hand side of that equation. On the right-hand side, it's half times the thrust force in the plume times the velocity of the plume. And at first sight, you think, oh, yeah, yeah, just, just supply a lot of power. Yeah, you, get, you can get a lot of velocity, a lot of thrust. But for you that do spacecraft design, you know you don't have arbitrary power available to you. You have fixed power. The constant in this equation is the power. You cannot tinker with this too much. So once you, once you fix the power, once you make that constant, then there's only two other variables you play with, thrust force or velocity. If you're after a lot of thrust, you better reduce that velocity. And the way you reduce that velocity is for this arrangement. The way you reduce that velocity when you've got a, a potential hill like this is you make the atom heavier. So you start to use argon, xenon. Because they're heavier, they're slower, they give you more thrust. If you look at the equation, oops, oh, uh, thrust uh, uh, power is a constant. You're starting to reduce the velocity, therefore thrust has to go up. And that's why you would use a heavier atom, which is what we're doing now. Okay, I can tell you, I'll show you some figures. Argon, we used argon, and that gave much more thrust than hydrogen. Okay, so these are our second attempts now to try and reduce the thruster size. Why do we want to reduce the thruster size? First of all, I have to tell you in all honesty that the thruster stopped at this point for many years because... We're not more efficient than hole thrusters. Hole thrusters are a well-developed technology and still under development, but they're a very popular technology. You can't really compete. Uh, and so life is too short to try and devote the rest of your life to try and make this thruster a going concern when there are already a mature technology out there. So it was a curiosity and it was left at that. Until the advent of nanosatellites. When, if you look at the smallest hole thruster they can make, I think the smallest amount of power they consume, and, that's, and they become really inefficient at that power, 50 watts. If you've ever dealt with a CubeSat, good luck trying to get 50 watts out of that. You maybe get 3 watts from the solar panels. You might have onboard battery that you can use the power, but then it's, you know, it's going to go rather quickly. So even miniaturized hole thrusters are really not suitable for CubeSats or even 2-unit or 3-unit sats. So, so at that point, having done certain experiments uh, with, with this reduced form of what we used affectionately became known as the pencil thruster, this is just a gas pipe, and if you've ever dealt with swage lock fittings, you'll realize how small this thing is. So there's the cone, there's anode, cathode, glass tube. So let me show you some results. Uh, at our best result, using argon, we were using 0.4 of a watt of power and getting 86 micronewtons. That is much more than hole thrusters can do. The flow rate of gas, what would you would call one, less than one milliliter per, per minute, one standard cubic centimeter per, sec, per minute, uh, incredibly low flow rate. The, the voltage required in this case was 15 kilovolts, which looks like a lot until I can show you a tiny, tiny module that can do one milliliter, watt of, no, one milliliter watt of power that is smaller than a 20 cent coin. They make these power supplies now. So a power supply is not an issue for this type of thruster once you start to miniaturize it. However, I, we have to note that this is not a very convenient thruster. It's still an experimental model. You really want to shrink something down to the size that you can put it on a CubeSat, on a face of a CubeSat, which is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. You want to shrink something 
down considerably with the same sort of power efficiency and thrust levels of around 100 micronewtons are more than enough for station keeping. In fact, units of micronewtons are more than enough. You can change orbit with, a, with a 100 micronewtons because the, the fuel will last you forever. Well, forever is an exaggeration for many, many months and you can have a burn time of many, many months and you can change your orbit by thousands of kilometers if you so wish to do that. But you probably don't because your license only covers this cell that you, they put you in and then you just say stay there and you can just apply the thrust in which case it'll last you probably years. Alright, so more comparisons with Hall thruster. If you look at Hall thruster typical values, the micronewtons per watt of power is about 60 micronewtons. Well we did get 80 micronewtons for roughly a watt of power. I know it was 0.4 watts but let's pretend we're out by 100%. Um, the specific impulse is another uh, is another is another measure of quality. That is, specific impulse really deals with how much thrust do you have divided by the rate of fuel that you used. It's kind of a, a sensible measure. How much thrust are you getting, or what rate are you using the fuel? Uh, the weight at, at sea level, if, if you like. So, if you do the unit analysis, the units come out to be in seconds. So, the higher the specific impulse, the more fuel efficient your thruster is. And so we're not as good as Hall thrusters, but we're not far off, if you look at it, for argon, 148. Uh, put error bars plus or minus 50% on this, because as I say, we're still trying to get the specifications of these things. So you can get to very good levels, and we've gotten really bad values, we've gotten got really good values, that's why I say put error bars on these. However, th this thruster, this pencil looking thruster, is not useful for nanosatellite. It's still not at the useful level. You really have to shrink it down and still have it providing this level of thrust. All right, so you have a CubeSat, you need to put a thruster somewhere, somewhere on this face and not impinge on the payload that's inside. Because usually people just want thrust and, mm -hmm. and, and I want to do the important stuff like take images of the Earth or uh, communicate something in some way. Uh, so, so there's usually these, these things are usually packed with electronics. I'm sure you're familiar with that, and you don't run fuel and thrust to take up a lot of the payload space. So that's the challenge that we set ourselves, and we've been collaborating with what used to be known as Defence Science and Technology Organisation, now called Defence Science and Technology Group. Uh, they are still the same people, but it's different labelling. The university has patented the, following, patented the following thruster, so I can reveal to you what it looks like now in order to, to flatten it so we can put it on a face of a CubeSat. Uh, it's been patented and we're at the stage we want, where we want to develop a prototype for commercialization. At the moment it's still a laboratory a prototype, and if you've ever mucked around with these, it's nothing you can plug and play into an industrial version. So alright, so here's from our Patent. So I can now, in previous, so this is the first time I'm showing it in slides where I couldn't do this before. You don't have, if you want to miniaturize the thruster, you're miniaturizing the cone to keep the pressure differential up. But then your thrust starts to fall. So the way to do it is to actually have multiple cones. So if you think about this, so if you can see this, this the cathode, the metal plate there, has cones uh, machined or or uh, 3D printed into them. So we haven't 3D printed it this yet, but we, we, you do a CAD file, you send it off, and people do numerical milling and you get it back. It's quite, for a couple of hundred dollars, it's really cheap tabletop technology that you can do. And so here's an insulator that you can 3D print, and, and there's, there's a metal plate, and the gas can go in there. I won't tell you what the gas is in the moment uh, uh, for this talk, but these problems, the problems of high pressure gas have been solved. Okay, so we, we're not facing that problem at all. Okay, so there it is. You have an array of cones. So now you can flatten off the whole thing. You can get a, easily get a discharge in there. You get acceleration and neutralization out of each one of these cones. And the more of them you have, the more thrust you have. That's it. You put it all together, and you end up with something... Uh, this picture comes from the DSTG group. I have to get used to not saying DSTO. DSTG group. Uh, this is an array of cones. Uh, there's the plume of the thruster, which consists of excited atoms. Uh, and then each, each one of these holes is roughly a millimeter in, in diameter. And, and this indeed does provide thrust. So 
Uh, that's pretty much, so how, how big is this? It's about maybe three kilometers, three, <laughs> <laughs> three centimeters, I'm used yes, to saying kilometers per second. Three centimeters by three centimeters, roughly that, so it very much can fit into the face. Now you can imagine what you need to do of the face of a CubeSat, but, but as you and I know, probably the future isn't in one unit CubeSat, it's probably two, two unit at least, three unit, probably six unit might become the norm, who knows. Uh, and certainly the power that this thing uses are units of watts, if not less than a unit of watt, of watt. And it's very hard for, say, for the thrust that you get. It's really hard. There are, there are competing technologies and they're very, very good. But it's really hard to get this level of efficiency. Uh, so, and mind you, when I say typical result, I'm quoting our best results. <laughs> okay. So, but, but it, so it, it, it's still a work in progress. So what's been done? Well, at the moment we're, we're at the stage where we are trying to make a technological readiness level of say five, six, maybe seven. Seven can go, can go up there. So at the moment it's probably three, four. You know, it's, it's still in the experimental prototype stage. It works. It just needs, you can imagine, you need to have the software and the electronics to have fuel handling to turn it off and on at the right times to integrate with the existing buses of, of, of satellites and things like that. So there's a, a, a quite an, a, a bit of development to do. Uh, but the physics is, is solid. So what, what I've shown you was uh, this, this new concept called charge exchange thruster uh, as for electric propulsion. Uh, that we have developed it to a level where you, it looks reasonable to have it as a to make a prototype so you can fly it and we've also shown that you can miniaturize these things to a, a very small scale so you, it's easy to put on a even single unit CubeSat. So that's where I will stop my talk and I think I've got like 10 minutes or so to answer questions. That's it. Good. Thank you. Yes, so the cathode can get warm and, and the anode can get warm, but it, um, it doesn't seem to rise above, the, the, when we're really turning up the power, sometimes it can go as much as 8 watts, say, which doesn't seem like a lot, but that's us full throttle, 8 watts, let's see what it can do. Uh, you you're getting less than 150 degrees, so it, it's, it's hot to the touch, obviously, but it's not, it's not a big deal. That's in a vacuum. It's in a vacuum, yeah, so you can put a thermocouple in there to measure the temperature. So it, uh, it's, uh, the temperature doesn't seem to be a big issue. Um, uh, the, the thruster that you saw here has a plastic body. It's 3D printed plastic body. Um, that's fine. It, it didn't... Uh, uh, but this is quite a small thruster. Uh, uh, it didn't, you know, it doesn't melt or anything. It just stays, uh, the form factor stays the same. Temperature is not it's not affected by that temperature. The form factor you've got there, you've changed it from the mold tube to the sort of Indeed. short flat thing. Yes. Um, that dimension between the anode and the cathode, what effect does that have? Ah, okay. So good, good, good point, Andrew. The um, it could make it harder to start up the discharge because, as you saw, we have no components to start the discharge. However. We found that if you choose your fuel appropriately, this discharge starts so easily that but that's the only issue. Otherwise, the bulk of the physics is occurring inside those cones. The, the acceleration and neutralization is in those cones. And as long as their dimensions are correct and you've got the right gas for, that, for those dimensions, <coughs> then you'll achieve neutralization. Is, the, is, is that array of cones, is that sort of scalable? <laughs> Oh. Want. Like, can that just keep going, or are you just limited uh, to No, no, you can keep going. So if you're interested in... It's, it's nothing I contemplated, but in principle, I mean, I never even thought that you can compete with more thrusters. And I think at the moment, the efficiency is not there. Right? But, uh, but in principle, you just keep scaling it up, because it's, you're just machining it, right? You're just machining yeah. these codes in this big metal plate. You can go up to, you know, not nanosatellites, but proper, proper spacecraft, not large scale. You can do that. And then it's just the power supply that you... Oh, yeah, the power requirement go up then. But then, on, on large spacecraft, like the ones that Hall thrusters generally go on, they've got kilowatts available to them. 
Well, if you've got killers, you can go, you know, a, you, you know, you can go maybe a, a, a tens of millinewtons up to a newton. Uh, you know, if you've got some like ten kilowatts or something like that. That specific impulse that you um, had for your argon one. Oh yeah, for the argon. You were comparing to the whole thing. I yeah, uh, so specific impulse. Have you? So you, you've tried obviously hydrogen and argon. I don't know what other gases. Hydrogen's. What is, what's the specific impulse for the others? Uh, hydrogen is. I'll give you a, a measure. So the same hydrogen requires more power, but you see the thrust is much less. It's uh, it's uh, a quarter almost. So you can expect a quarter of the specific impulse. And, and sorry. You can expect a quarter of that. So that's why I say if you choose your gas correctly, you can get the specific impulse quite high. Whereas if you choose it incorrectly, it can be quite low. So if you were comparing them to the same gas, for Oh, no. In a sense, you're right. Uh, yeah. th this is not a direct gas. This is argon. Uh, we didn't have xenon uh, at the time. I think we've got xenon now. Uh, and that has yet to be tried. But uh, this whole thrust is using xenon. And uh, I'm using argon. I don't expect xenon to be very different from, from that, but we have yet to try that. But I have to say, we're, we're not using xenon in our prototype, we're using something else. Can I answer that? Yeah. I think it's just the square root of 2 kT over the molecular mass. Right, right, yeah. So you need to know the temperature as well. You need to know the temperature. <laughs> In this case, temperature may not be an appropriate term because temperature relies on the, on the distribution of particles that follows what you call a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. This, as you can see from the, from the Doppler spectra, this is anything but a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. It's kind of got almost a mono-energetic peak at a certain, uh, a certain energy. It has a spread on it, but it's... Uh, so we have to probably find a different term than temperature, maybe average energy or something like that. Average velocity, yeah, something like that. Yeah, Bill's got a question. Oh, how do you generate the plasma? I mean, is that uh, it's really simple? Uh, because that's a power sink as well, isn't it? You've got it is, it is. But if you look at, we're actually measuring the power to do that. So here it is. We have our little power supplies, high voltage power supplies, and and you just supply. Positive voltage here, negative voltage here, let in your gas, it ionizes and plume comes out. That's it. So all your control electronics has to do is switch the power supply on and off. And then you'd have <coughs> a valve to switch gas on and off. So it's a binary system. You can control your thrusts that way. Can you change the geometry to change the exit velocity? Or does it work Ah, good point. Uh, the geometry is very much important for the exit velocity. Yeah, because you want to uh, you want to enable charge exchange to occur uh, for most of the ions, and you want them the average energy, average velocity reached to be the velocity that you want. So it's a game of uh, length and uh, aspect ratio of, of the um, of the cone, and then it's gas dependent to to some degree. I mean, uh, it's flexible. We put in all sorts of gases for the same cone. It works fine. But it looks like you have to, to optimize the system, you just, you really should make it for a particular gas. Right. Yeah, I, I guess that was my main uh, question. Does that enable you to use maybe cheaper gases or? Gas oh, I can assure you the gas we're using now is dirt cheap. Right. The yeah. argon. Yeah, sure. No, it's cheaper than that. So, uh, oh, really? let, let's not talk about this in okay, Sorry, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Top secret. <laughs> well, I shouldn't spread it around since I don't right. <laughs> know if that's widely spread at the moment, so I'm just playing it safe. Yeah, yeah. So, so your question. Uh, <clears throat> normally in uh, chemical rockets, you know, you've got the uh, convergent and divergent nozzle, right? Ah, uh, yes. Is that inefficient that you're actually some... I, I don't uh, think... I don't... This... The, the plume is coming out in... I'm saying is there some force on the nozzle which is actually going the wrong way? I, I don't know, but I don't think so. The reason you have this sort of uh, inverted nozzle in, in, in traditional thrust, it's, it's more of a hydrodynamic problem. So th this is fluid flow problem. This, this thruster operates not in fluid flow regime, but molecular flow regime. It's a very different mm -hmm. physics. The pressure is so low that collisions between atoms are not that frequent. And so 
it's, it's a different uh, regime, so you, it, it, it won't follow the same sort of mathematics that you would apply for normal, normal chemical rockets, say. Right. So the, the inverted cone, so because you're seeing, hey, the cone's the, the wrong way around. It shouldn't be the other way around if, you, if that's so, what you mean. So your positive ions actually strike the uh, cathode? Oh, part of the generation of the discharge is, if I can go back to the picture. So there's eyes in there, and they see a bit of acceleration. They don't just accelerate along the axis. They accelerate in all sorts of directions. But admittedly, they, there is a preferred direction along the axis. When the ions strike the inside surface of that cone, that helps generate the plasma because when ions strike the inside of it, that's why I say if you choose your material correctly, what, electrons come out from the inside surface called secondary electrons. You need secondary electrons to sustain a discharge. Without them, it will all stop. So you need a material when ions strike at a certain energy, electrons come out. And so that's, the electrons that are coming out are the ones that you see striking the glass. A fraction of those strikes the background gas, which ionizes that further, which produces further ions to strike the inside of that cone, and, and so the process goes over and over again. Would it be more efficient to have it, say, so but thermionic emission? That's, well? that's more power used. Yeah. I, no, thermionic, no, no. Actually, if you can start up a discharge, don't use thermionic emission, because the number of electrons you can get from that is small compared to the number of electrons you can get from a discharge. How does what you're doing compare with what they're doing at A and U? Uh, they have uh, a radio frequency thruster, and I think I think it's called pocket rocket is the term. <laughs> and and what what they do, my understanding is, is essentially heating up the plasma, but the pressure is so high that it heats up the ambient gas. It's more close to probably a resistor jet, that sort of thing. So it's heating the ambient gas, and that hot gas emerges and provides thrust. Uh, this one is not that. You make sure that the collisionality between the ions and the, uh, the neutral gas is small. For, you want charge exchange. You don't want all the momentum of that ion to be imparted to the background gas. That would be momentum transfer. You want to just allow it to steal an electron and head along its merry way out of there without colliding any further. So that's why the pressure you use inside, as well as the nozzle length, determines um, whether you're going to get charge exchange thrust or just heating of the gas, thrust coming out from the heating of the gas. So the ANU, to the best of my understanding, is they have <coughs> they use a radio frequency discharge and a high enough pressure to heat the gas so the gas becomes hot, expands, and that provides thrust. Any other questions? All right, thanks, Joe. Okay, thank you.